and all of us, shoulder to shoulder, will ascend to the lofty realm of freedom. And if we should not achieve that final consummation, if things should become worse than before, if the whole truth should be more unsupportable than the half, if it should be proved that the silent are in the right as the guardians of existence, if the faint hope that we still possess should give way to complete hopelessness, the attempt is still worth the trial, since you do not desire to live as you are compelled to live. Well then, why do you make it as a reproach against the others that they are silent and remain silent yourself? easy to answer because I am a dog in essentials just as locked in in silence as the others stubbornly resisting my own questions dour out of fear to be precise it is in the hope that they might answer me that I have questioned my fellow dogs at least since my adult years have I any such foolish hope can I contemplate the foundations of our existence, divine their profundity, watch the labour of their construction, that dark labour, and expect all this to be forsaken, neglected, undone, simply because I ask a question? No, that I truly expect no longer. I understand my fellow dogs, and flesh of their flesh, of their miserable, ever-renewed, ever-desirous flesh, Yet, it is not merely flesh and blood that we have in common, but knowledge also. Not only knowledge, but the key to it as well. I do not possess that key, except in common with all the others. I cannot grasp it without their help. The hardest bones containing the richest marrow can be conquered only by a united crunching of all the teeth of all dogs. That, of course, is only a figure of speech and exaggerated. If all teeth were but ready, they would not even need to bite. The bones would crack themselves, and the marrow would be freely accessible to the feeblest of dogs. If I remain faithful to this metaphor, then the goal of my aims, my questions, my inquiries, appear monstrous. It is true. For if I want to compel all dogs thus to assemble together, I want the bones to crack open under the pressure of this collective preparedness. And then I want to dismiss them to the ordinary life that they love, while all by myself, quite alone, I lap up the marrow. That sounds monstrous. Almost as if I wanted to feed on all the marrow, not merely of a bone, but of the whole canine race itself. But it is only a metaphor. The marrow that I am discussing here is no food. On the contrary, it's a poison. My questions only serve as a goad to myself. If I want to be stimulated by the silence which rises up around me as the ultimate answer, how long will you be able to endure the fact that the world of dog as your researchers make more and more evident, is pledged to silence and always will be. How long will you be able to endure it? That is the really great question of my life, before which all the smaller ones sink into insignificance. It is put to myself alone and concern no one else, and concerns no one else. Unfortunately, I can answer it more easily than the smaller specific questions. I shall probably hold out till my natural end. The calm of old age will put up a greater and greater resistance to all my disturbing questions. I shall very likely die in silence, surrounded by silence, indeed almost peacefully. And I look forward to that with composure, an admirably strong heart, lungs that it's impossible to use up before their time have been given to us dogs as if in malice. We survive all questions, even our own bulwarks of silence that we are. Recently I've taken more and more to examining my life, looking for the, de the decisive, the fundamental error that I must have surely have made. 
and I cannot find it. And yet I must have made it. For if I had not made it, and yet were unable by the diligent labour of a long life to achieve my desire, that would prove that my desire is impossible, and complete hopelessness must follow. Behold then, the work of a lifetime. First of all, my inquiries into the questions. Whence does the earth procure the food it gives us? A young dog, at bottom, naturally greedy for life, I renounced all enjoyments, apprehensively avoided all pleasure, buried my head between my front paws when I was confronted by temptation, and addressed myself to the task. I was no scholar, neither in the information I inquired, nor in the method, nor in the intention. That was probably a defect, but it could not have been a decisive one. I had had little schooling, for I left my mother's care at an early age, and soon got used to independence. I led a free life, and premature independence is inimical to systematic learning. But I've seen much, listened to much, spoken with dogs of all sorts and conditions, understood everything. I believe, fairly intelligently, and correlated with my particular observations fairly intelligently, that has comp and that has compensated somewhat for my lack of scholarship, not to mention that independence. If it is a disadvantage in learning things, it is an actual advantage when one is making one's own inquiries. In my case, it was all more necessary as I was not able to employ the real methods of silence, science to avail myself, that is, of the labours of my predecessors, and establish contact with contemporary investigators. I was entirely cast on my own resources, began at the very beginning, and with the consciousness inspiring to youth, but utterly crushing to age, but the fortuitous point to which I carried my labours must also be the final one. Was I really so alone in my inquiries at the beginning and up to now? Yes and no. It is inconceivable that there must not always have been and that there are not today individual dogs in the same case as myself. I cannot be so accursed as that. I do not deviate from the dog nature by a hairbreadth. Every dog has, like me, the impulse to question, and I have, like every dog, the impulse not to answer. Everyone has the impulse to question. How otherwise could my questions have affected my hearers in the slightest? And they were often affected, to my ecstatic delight, an exaggerated delight, I must confess. And how otherwise could I have prevented from achieving much more than I have done? And that I have the compulsion to remain silent needs, unfortunately, no particular proof.